Right, so your final topic in uh, this course uh, on the initial and final value theorems, right? Okay, so initial and final value theorems would involve taking limits of uh, a function of S here, right? Uh, so in other words, taking limits of a Laplace transform, right? As the S goes to infinity, right? Okay, so uh, what we're going to do for a couple of minutes is review how you evaluate these sorts of limits, right? Right. The Laplace transform usually takes the form of a rational function of S. In other words, you have a polynomial of S on top and you have a polynomial of uh, S below, right? Such as this here, right? Okay, so when we do in uh, your initial value theorem, for your initial value theorem, what we need to do is we need to take the limit as s goes to infinity, right? Okay, so a little review on how you do these sorts of uh, limits, right? So you have a polynomial, you sorry, you have a rational function, right? With a polynomial on top and a polynomial below. And you want to take the limit as the x goes to infinity, right? All right, okay, so what's your approach? I mean, the approach is you, if you have your polynomial below, right, and you look for your highest power, which in this case is x cubed, right, and you're going to divide both top and bottom by x cubed, right? So let's work out this first one here, right? Okay, so you want to get the limit of uh, this rational function as x goes to infinity, right? All right, so what you do is this is a rational function. You look in the denominator here. You look at the highest power. You look for the highest power. Highest power is x cubed, right? So you divide both top and bottom by x cubed, right? So notice you didn't change anything really um, uh, because you're doing the same thing on the top and the bottom, right? Okay, so I divide everything on the bottom by x cubed and I divide everything on the top by x cubed. And what happens okay so when I divide uh, by the x cubed say okay so the x squared divided by x cubed would give me 1 on x the 2 divided by the x cubed well it gives me 2 on x cubed x cubed 1 x cubed give me 1 right x squared on x cubed gives me 1 on x and minus 1 on x cubed give me one, gives me 1 on x cubed, right? Okay, and now I take the limit of this as x goes to infinity, right? Now as x goes to positive infinity, 1 on x is going to go to 0, the 2 on x cubed is going to go to 0, the 1 on x is going to go to 0, and the 1 on x cubed is going to go to 0, right? So Anything with x to a power in your denominator here, anything of that sort of form, 1 on x or 1 on x cubed, right? That's going to go to 0. So these are just 0 here. And I'm left with uh, 0 on top and 1 below. And 0 divided by 1 is 0. Okay. Right. So let's take a, an example of this. Let's look at a second one over here, right? And it's the same idea, right? What you want to do is you look uh, for your highest power in your denominator here, which is x cubed, and you divide both top and bottom by that x cubed, right? So I have x cubed plus 5x on 2x cubed minus x squared plus 4. And I divide uh, each term on top by x cubed, and I divide each term on the bottom by x cubed, right? Yeah, and when I do that, I'll get a 1 here, right? I'll get 5 on x squared here, right? And then I'll get this over here, right? Then you take your limit as x goes to infinity. Anything with uh, an x in your denominator over here is going to go to 0. So this will go to 0. This will go to 0. This will go to 0, right? And you end up with 1 over here on top and 2 below. So your limit as x goes to infinity is a half.
All right, okay, so we want to discuss initial value theorem, right? All right, so what's the idea in initial value theorem, right? Okay, so what you, it's like taking an inverse Laplace transform without actually doing the inverse Laplace transform, right? Okay, so we have some y of s over here, right? Um, big y of s, right? So we have a Laplace transform. But say for some reason we don't actually know the inverse Laplace transform small y of t, right? What initial value theorem is going to allow us to do, right, is we can in fact figure out um, what the initial value is. So if this is the theoretical inverse, right, Laplace transform, so the function of t, right, what we could do is we could figure out its value at t is equal to zero without um, calculating the inverse Laplace transform, right? So normally if you wanted to find y of uh, zero over here, how you do it is you'd have to take inverse Laplace of this, figure out what the y of t is, and then put in t is equal to zero, right? So what initial value theorem is doing for you, it's actually bypassing that, right? Um, you can figure out what the y of zero is, without actually taking the inverse Laplace transform. And you know that um, taking inverse Laplace transforms isn't the easiest thing to do, right? So sometimes if you just want the y of zero, the initial value theorem is a faster way to do it, right? Okay, so your statement of uh, initial value theorem, right? You have certain conditions, right? Um, these conditions are similar for your conditions for Laplace transform of a derivative, right? Um, we want the y of t to be continuous and of expon exponential order. Exponential order is a control on the size of the y of t. We want y prime of t to be piecewise continuous on every finite interval and also of exponential order, right? Okay, so this piecewise continuous of on every finite interval or piecewise continuous on a finite interval, we discussed that already, right? Um, that was, we did that um, when we were discussing piecewise continuity uh, earlier on in the course. Right. Okay, so if I wanna get, so I have the y of s, the y of s the Laplace transform is given to me. And what I wanna get is I want to get the small y of t, the function of t, I want to evaluate that at zero, right? Okay, so what I have over here is slightly inaccurate. Um, this here, this should be y zero, but um, y zero as you head towards zero from the right-hand side, right? So this is your right-hand limit of y of t at t is equal to zero, right? You can think of it as uh, what happens when t is equal to zero, but strictly speaking, it's when you're approaching zero from the right-hand side, right? And right-hand limits we talked about already, right? Um, we talked about right-hand limits a while ago, right? Okay. Okay, right, so if I want to get uh, y zero plus here, right, um, right-hand limit, of y as t tends to zero, right? How I do it is by evaluating this limit over here, right? So y of s is the Laplace transform that was given to me. What I need to do, okay, so big y of s is Laplace of small y of t. What I do is multiply that big y of s by s and I take the limit as s goes to infinity. All right, okay, so let's do this example problem of using initial value theorem, right? All right, so I'm given big Y of S is S on S squared plus one, right? And what I want to do is I want to use the initial value theorem to calculate Y zero, right? And remember, strictly speaking, there should be Y zero instead of Y zero here. I should have Y zero plus, right? Okay, so where y0 plus is right-hand limit of the y of t as t heads towards zero, right? Okay, so I wanna get y0 plus, right, um, without calculating the inverse Laplace transform, right? In other words, what I would need to do is I'd need to evaluate this limit here, right? So I'd need to multiply the big y of s 
by s, right? And then take the limit as s goes to infinity, right? So let's do that, right? Okay, so to get the new i zero, right? New i zero plus to be more precise, right? Um, what you're doing is you're using initial value theorem, right? So this initial value theorem here. And the y, the big y of s is given to you, s on s squared plus one, right? So this is the big y of s, and to get y zero, right? Um, what you're doing is you multiply the big y of s by s, right? So you get s times s on s squared plus one, and you're taking the limit of that as s goes to infinity, right? Okay, so when I multiply this out here, I get s squared on s squared plus one. Uh, where the limit as is as s goes to infinity, right? Um, right um, here. Okay, so this is similar to what we talked about, right? Where you're taking the limits as x goes to infinity of a rational function. There is a small technicality in the fact that um, your s over here is complex, right? So here, what you're doing is you take any limit in the in the context or in the sense that uh, where the s is complex and here it's understood that the x over here is real right but it doesn't really um it's not going to be make a difference for us in the, in this case right um so for this case over here we could even just basically think of the s as being real and we will get the correct answer right if you do want a justification for that the justification for that is, in fact, given here, right? Okay. okay. The statement over here, right? In particular, you could just think as when you're going from s going to infinity, you could just essentially just use real values of s. But that's not really important for us. Um, what um, we're going to do is when we work in these out, we just work it out as what I explained from before, right? Using the methods from before. And what was the method from before? The method from before is you look for your highest power of s in your denominator and you divide throughout by that, right? So when you divide top and bottom by s squared, you're going to get a 1 on top. This s squared would be s squared on s squared, so you get a 1. And here you're going to get 1 divided by s squared, which is 1 on s squared. Right? And now you take the limit as s goes to infinity. This will drop to 0. Right? And you're going to get 1 on 1 plus 0, which is 1. Right? So from your initial value theorem, if the y of t, right, um, the inverse Laplace transform of the y of s, right? its value at t is equal to zero, right? Or more precisely, the right-hand limit as t goes to zero is equal to one, right? Okay, so let's do the second part of this problem, right? The second part of this problem is really just to, just, uh, to show you why, or to verify that your initial value theorem works, right? So if you want to get um, the small y of t evaluated at t is equal to zero, right? Um, you could use your initial value theorem, or you could do it uh, the somewhat hard way, right? Where you actually take the inverse Laplace transform of this to get small y of t. And then once you have that small y of t, you just pretty much put in the t is equal to zero, right? So that's what we're doing over here, right? We, if you want, we're doing it in sort of hard way, right? Okay, so the big Y of S is S on S squared plus one, and the small Y is the inverse Laplace transform of that, right? And this is just coming directly from a table, right? Um, so Laplace transform of S on S squared plus one is cosine of T, right? And you wanna notice when you put T is equal to zero into this, right? Um, you get Y is zero, which is cosine of zero, which is equal to one, right? Okay, so the moral of the story is this way here, using initial value theorem, we got the value of y zero, which is equal to one without finding inverse Laplace transform. Okay, and for part B, we actually went ahead and did it the hard way, where we got the inverse Laplace transform, right, which is the y of t 
the cosine of t and then we put in t is equal to zero to get the initial value right so both cases we get the initial value this is doing it the hard way where we use we need to actually calculate the inverse Laplace transform and this is just using limits okay it may not seem as if it's well it's not a lot of work over here right because your Laplace transform here is pretty simple right but we all know that um, your Laplace transform isn't always as basic as this right so sometimes if you want to get this y0 it's easier to do it this way using your initial value theorem if we have a function small y of t where t here is time variable right well what is initial what is your initial value of y of t right your initial value of this function right means that you put t is equal to 0 right into your function to get y0 right right now similarly or uh, analogously right you if you want your final value right uh, well your final value is not when um, t is equal to 0 but your final value is well when the small t actually um, you want to get the value of y of t in the long run right so when the small t in fact goes to infinity right so this expression over here limit of uh, your function y of t as t goes to infinity right this here is the final value of your function y of t right okay so in other words it's uh, what happens to y of t in the long run right um, okay and if for some reason your y of t had some sort of limiting behavior right for example if it heads to zero right then your final value here would be well it would be zero Okay, so let's look at this final value theorem, right? Right, so your setup is you, the usual notation that Laplace of small y of t is big Y of s, right? And usually it, well, for final value theorem in our applications, the big Y of s is given to us, right? Okay, so your big Y of s is given to us. You'd have certain technical conditions which would be satisfied for us in this course, right? Okay, so you have, you're given the big Y of S, right? And what you want to get is you want to get the final value of the function small y of t, right? And remember by final value, right? I mean the limit of this function Y of t as t goes to infinity, right? Okay, so how you do that is by evaluating a limit, right? And you're evaluating a limit of S Y of S so this is similar to what we did for initial value okay so for initial value we had s y of s right and likewise over here we have s y of s right but for initial value what we were taking limit as s goes to infinity right and here what we're doing is we're taking limit as s goes to zero right all right, so we get our final value of y of t by taking the limit of y of s times s, but as s goes to zero, right? Okay, now one thing when we use in final value, right? Um, initial value, there was, I mean, while you have these technical conditions, the initial value will basically always just work for us, right? But it's not the same for final value, right? So for final value theorem, it, this final value theorem is only really going to hold if when you look at this function of s and you look at the poles in other words you look at the denominator of it and you solve the denominator and you get the poles from that right the poles must lie strictly on your left hand side of your complex plane right okay so for example here right uh, this is your complex plane right complex s plane right okay so in order for your final value theorem to work for your s y of s your poles must lie on this left hand side over here right if your poles don't hold on your left hand side this is not going to work right or may not work and what would happen is that this limit will not exist right so in order for this limit to exist right in order for final value theorem to work you need that your poles 
for example like these poles over here your poles would need to be on the left hand side of your complex plane right okay so let's do an example of using final value theorem right okay so we give another plus transform big y of s which is this big y of s over here Again, this big Y of S is 1 on S, S plus 1, right? Right, and as I said, right, in order for final value theorem to work, right, what you'd need to do is you need to check that um, all the poles of S, Y of S lie strictly on the left-hand side of your complex plane, right? So in this question, they ask you to check that first of all, right? Okay, so... Well, what's your poles of S, Y of S, right? The first thing that you'd need to do is you'd need to actually work out what the S, Y of S is, right? Okay, so if Y of S is 1 on S, S plus 1, right, which is this over here, then S, Y of S, you just take an S, multiplying it by your Y of S, right? And you notice that this S here will cancel with the S in the denominator. So you get 1 on S plus 1, right? Right now, what are the poles over here, right? You get the poles by setting your denominator here equal to zero, right? So when you set S plus one is equal to zero, you get your pole, S is equal to minus one, right? And that is on the left-hand side of your complex plane, strictly on the left-hand side of the complex S plane, right? Okay, so it's S is equal to minus one. This is a diagram of your complex S plane, right? And in fact, your zero is going to be right there, right? At minus one, which is in the left-hand side of your complex S plane, right? Okay, so we, the condition of uh, your final value theorem is satisfied, right? Um, the pole of uh, S, Y of S, which is S is equal to minus one, is on the left hand side of the complex plane, right? Which means now we can actually use final value theorem. Right. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to actually use your final value theorem to get, well, the final value of uh, y of t, right? So we want to get the final value of y, right? And this is our final value theorem right here, right? So to get your final value, we work out this limit right, of S, Y of S as S goes to zero, right? Okay, so we, using your final value theorem over here, your final value is equal to this limit as S goes to zero, right? Okay, and S, Y of S, we actually worked out from before, S, Y of S is one on S plus one. And when we take the limit of this as S goes to zero, this is actually easy to work out, right? Um, all you do is you just substitute S is equal to zero into this. This is because this function over here is continuous at s is equal to zero, so you could just simply substitute the s is equal to zero into it. And we get one over zero plus one, which is one, right? So your final value of um, your function y of t, in other words, the limit of it as t goes to infinity, right? Using final value theorem is equal to one. And the last part of uh, this question is we want to actually check what uh, this our answer, right? Okay, so in order to get um, the limit, uh, your final value, which is the limit of the small y of t as t goes to infinity, right? You could do it this way using final value, which is what we just did. Or you could do it the hard way where you actually find a small y of t by taking the inverse Laplace transform of the big Y of S. And then once you get the small Y of T, you take the limit of that as T goes to infinity, right? So that's what we're gonna do here, right? So they tell us to do that actually, right? Um, so the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get the small Y of T by taking Laplace inverse transform of the big Y of S, which is given to you. Okay, so the small y of t is Laplace inverse of uh, the big Y of s. The big Y of s is 1 on s, s plus 1, right? right and in order to work this out, you'd need to use a little bit of partial fractions. When you use your partial fractions, this 1 on s, s plus 1 will decompose into 1 on s minus 1 on s plus 1, right? And then, well, what I want to do is take Laplace inverse of this which means I'm taking Laplace inverse of the individual pieces. 
Laplace inverse of 1 on s is 1, and Laplace inverse of 1 on s plus 1 is e to the minus t, right? So I get this. Right. And now from this, I can get my final value, which is the limit as t goes to infinity, right? And the limit as t goes to infinity of this y of t, y, y of t, which is 1 minus e to the minus t. Well, you just work it out, right? As t goes to infinity, this is not going to change. It's just going to be 1. And this is an exponential where your coefficient in front of the t is negative, right? And we talked about that already, right? This sort of exponential where your coefficient is negative over here. As t goes to infinity, this exponential goes to 0, right? So you get 1 minus 0. So the limit of your function y of t, so your final value here is 1, right? And that agrees with the answer that we got from part B, where we use final value theorem.